Hello, Assalamu Alaikum. Good morning, Assalamu Alaikum. Namaste, Sastri Akal, or Anjali Mudra. I am your host here today um, on JKTV. Uh, my name is Shams Rahman. And uh, uh, today um, I will be shortly, hopefully, I will be uh, linked up with the uh, people in London and uh, we will be um, live streaming uh, this uh, Kashmir Freedom March from London uh, on JKTV. Uh, different uh, people will be streaming it from different ends and in different languages, mainly Pahari Urdu and English. And uh, um, here uh, in uh, studio, uh, I will uh, try to give uh, a brief um, explanation and uh, background information about uh, the protest and about the organizers, the British Kashmiris, and what the protest is about, uh, the situation inside Kashmir, and how um, we got to this point, this stage this situation how things evolved inside the state of jammu kashmir uh, from uh, colonial time uh, to today um, when kashmir state is divided under the control of india and pakistan so this is a kind of theme of uh, today's uh, show and uh, um, uh, we will uh, um, Yeah, and, and there are very interesting comments uh, come up when we um, start any show. Um, and it's uh, for, for the first time that uh, I, for certainly, I am experiencing um, that people from Indian and Pakistani sides are their perspective, mainly Indians and Pakistanis. Uh, they uh, both actually troll us. And I, I see that as something very positive, because that means that we are not taking sides for the first time. We are speaking as it is in Kashmir on both sides. And um, uh, that's why some people are not used to it. Even us Kashmiris born and grown up on both sides of the divide, division line, we were always from childhood uh, told one, a narrative one story on the, on that side it was mainly the indian story on this side it was the pakistani story and our own story the kashmiri story different version of it different um, colors of it were never uh, actually reached to us when uh, we were in uh, schools and colleges and even in university uh, because we were not, not told about migration we were not told about uh, how the actually state was divided and what happened in Mirpur. We were not told. We were told what happened in Jammu with Muslims, but we were not told what happened in Mirpur with Hindus. And similarly, on the other side, they were told what happened in Mirpur and perhaps not told what happened in Jammu. And in Valley, obviously, there's a different situation and uh, you know how things evolved there. So there are a lot of questions about uh, Kashmir and Kashmiris and the state. Who is Kashmiri? Who is not Kashmiri? Um, do you have to speak Kashmiri language to become Kashmiri? Or you can be Kashmiri if you are state subject? And that is the rule which uh, uh, India has recently uh, abolished. It is the state subject rule. The only the people of the state of Jammu Kashmir are entitled to have a permanent resident there and right to property and employment and all that. So the, these are various questions uh, which obviously are coming up at different uh, uh, points. Um, but there is no, uh, at the moment, obviously, the way situation is inside Kashmir, 
uh, is uh, is very difficult to talk about these questions which are seen as political and which distract uh, attention and maybe to some extent they do that uh, but i will try to just inform people and not uh, um, you know distract because i think the information is very important for people um, who are not aware of what is happening there and who are not aware of uh, how the communities are made up uh, of here in britain and uh, uh, so the so it is that's why i'm i'm doing this program mainly in english because uh, i want to convey information to people uh, who uh, cannot uh, understand other languages which we usually which i usually do programs in like urdu pahari and uh, um and obviously this is this uh, include people who are not uh, of kashmiri heritage in britain uh, who are british uh, um, either british local white british or other uh, are uh, have come from other parts of the world uh, and also the young uh, kashmiris who were born and grown up here and whose uh, urdu is uh, Uh, not very good and pahari is also they can also converse uh, to some extent but still uh, not very fluent so that is why i'm trying to uh, do this program in english so first of all um as you can see um, th that uh, um this um, um the the march uh, which is um, going to um start from uh, um parliament square in london uh, in about uh, um 43 minutes if it starts at time but the time the starting time is uh, um um 12 o'clock today uh, but um, don't know what what time exactly it will start and um the, the you know this this uh, i said as you can see but i can't see any footage as yet um but uh, uh, probably they will stream a at a different kind of uh, uh, channel different uh, kind of uh, page at, at the same page but different streamings and um, uh, so probably they'll start at 12 and uh, um also um, um i mean i am I'm, i'm trying to get in touch with uh, get linked up with one of uh, our uh, reporters uh, there who uh, who can uh, update us how the things are there right now uh, but i will uh, um try that and if it does not work then i will tell you the background story and hopefully then uh, we will uh, link up when we link up uh, we will keep updating you about the march as well so let me try if i can link up with javed iqbal who is uh, um in london and uh, hopefully if we if we could uh, get connected then i will uh, uh, speak to him and uh, update you about what is happening there but before that um let me tell you the story of uh, kashmir and kashmiris or, or i think we should start with british kashmiris because this march today uh, is organized by uh, british kashmiris and i this is for the first time that uh, a march is organized in britain of this scale uh, by british kashmiris because usually it is by different political parties and um, or different groups but this is uh, for the first time that uh, a march is organized of uh, you know of a british uh, kind of uh, level and uh, it is uh, organized the organizers are calling themselves british kashmiris so that is why i think it's important uh, that uh, um i um 
start with the um, you know the British Kashmiris, the story of British Kashmiris. Not many people know uh, that uh, there are about nearly a million uh, Kashmiris in Britain. And um, ironically, I didn't know that as well, that uh, why they came over, when they came over. And although I was born in the area where uh, almost 99% migration uh, took place, um, you know, in that part of Kashmir I was born and grown up in, where the 99% of migration uh, has taken place from. Uh, and because it's never taught in our schools, it's never taught in colleges, it not even was taught in university. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I did post graduation in sociology from Karachi University, and I had no idea about migration from Mirpur uh, till I came to Britain. And uh, uh, all I knew from, uh, um, you know, from surrounding, uh, there was no formal uh, education about migration anyway. But all I knew was that because Mangala Dam was built and then people had to leave and they were sent to Britain by Pakistani government. And I was always uh, uh, obliged and you know, I, I was always a kind of... Um, uh, glad I was always a kind of uh, um, thankful uh, to to Pakistani government for that because uh, I thought I, di I didn't I didn't understand the impact of uh, dam and uh, its uh, economy and its politics. Uh, I just thought that because dam had to be built and when they built it, then um, people who were affected, they were compensated and then they were uh, sent to Britain. And that is why uh, there is a prosperity in Mirpur and uh, there are so many Kashmiris in Britain and who are um, living a relatively prosperous uh, life here in, in Britain than those uh, inside Pakistan or in Mirpur or in other side of Kashmir. So I was kind of grateful uh, to um, Pakistani rulers. Uh, but, but when I came to Britain, I, there was some change in me which happened in uh, Karachi. Uh, be, you know, that was 11th of February 1984. Uh, before that, I was I saw myself as Pakistani and I saw Kashmir as part of Pakistan, natural part of Pakistan. It was rightfully, um, you know, Pakistan's because it was a Muslim majority state. And I always thought the people were given two choices when uh, Indian subcontinent was uh, um, left by, by British and they said those areas with the majority of Muslims will become Pakistan and those with uh, other communities will become India. So Kashmir was majority Muslim state, therefore it had to be part of Pakistan and because the rulers were uh, was Hindu, so therefore it went to India. And uh, the Pakistan's claim is legitimate and rightful. That is, I always thought, till 11th of February 1984. Uh, but on that day, uh, when uh, I, along with uh, many other friends, uh, Kashmiri students uh, from Karachi University, went to protest outside of uh, Indian uh, airline office. Uh, which was uh, situated situated in the Intercontinental Hotel, the precinct of Intercontinental Hotel. Now it's called Pearl Continental. And it was very uh, beautiful, uh, glossy shops. Uh, but when, you know, our university buses stopped there, uh, Kashmiri students started uh, stone, you know, pelting stones. And they kind of... Uh, broke all the, those shops into uh, glass shops into, you know, pieces. And uh, then we went to Indian Embassy and then, you know, I, I was kind of very shocked and uh, didn't participate in any of this. Um, but, you know, to cut the story short, when there were arrests made, I was arrested too. And I didn't know what to do because I, you know, I was not arrested along with other uh, students, protesters. I was arrested on my own because I tried to run away and uh, I was arrested from there. 
and the, the, the beating the police gave to me and the uh, kind of uh, humiliation that started kind of uh, started my um, journey of knowing about Kashmir and Kashmiris. Um, because that day I started asking questions why they did that, why they said this at uh, the police people, why they were saying you all Kashmiris are traitors and this kind of language. We were protesting against the in against India because India hanged Makbul but so it's so all these uh, uh, questions started coming in my mind and that that is when my journey of knowing about this million really started. But when I came to Britain, I had some understanding of the Kashmir uh, question. Uh, I thought it's not just India that is responsible uh, for uh, that, that a referendum was not held, uh, which was promised uh, at UN by different world powers. And the Pakistan was also responsible. And that is when I started realizing that Azad Kashmir and Gilgit Baldistan are also part of the state and they are administered by Pakistan, uh, controlled by Pakistan, but they are not part of Pakistan. They are actually part of the state of Jammu Kashmir, whose future has not yet been decided. Though also Pakistan has some area, India has some area, and they both claim that it is theirs and the whole state is theirs. Uh, India says a two tongue, Pakistan says it's Sharag, but actually, constitutionally, legally, these whole areas are not part of Pakistan or India. So, these information, when I learned about these things, I was quite surprised and I, I didn't believe in uh, uh, at first because I thought these pro independence type people are telling me this. So, I have to confirm it from other sources. And I did that and I saw, yeah, actually that is the case. Uh, and similarly, when I came to Britain, I didn't know nothing about migration or when it started and all that. But when I came here and I met uh, some uh, people, academic people, because I, I was exploring to pursue my studies here, uh, which I found very difficult initially, but uh, Although I started working with the education sector and then I moved on to communication sector with different local authorities. And that is where I learned uh, that, uh, um, you know, th th this, uh, th there are certain issues for our community here. That is where I learned that uh, in Britain, there is something called uh, equality legislation, uh, according to which all communities who are residing in Britain, they have a right to uh, have material translated in their languages if they don't understand English. And uh, they can have uh, their history taught in, in schools and colleges and places. And, uh, you know, about their uh, heritage. And, and, and there are, uh, at that time, when I came in 1988, there, there were special opportunities created for different migrant communities who were left behind and uh, so they, they were encouraged and supported and facilitated uh, to do certain type of education, to uh, take certain type of training and uh, uh, to, to, to learn about uh, diff you know, different uh, aspects of British life and skills and all that. So there were sort of a lot of opportunities in those areas and uh, certain specialist jobs and all that. And then I thought that when it, then when the advertise when those posts or opportunities are advertised, it is said that it is for you know particularly for people of Pakistani or Indian or you know these backgrounds, mm -hmm. and and Bangladeshis, and there was nothing about Kashmiris. And then I learned the Kashmiris in Britain are classified as Pakistanis because they come from Pakistani area, and those who come from Indian side, they are classified as Indians. So this, this was the kind of, uh, these were the new um, questions for me, new areas to know about. And uh, I uh, was lucky that uh, I met some good people who then introduced me to scholarship on this. And I, I can kind of uh, 
became student at Manchester University in 1997. Actually, from 92 onwards, I was linked with the university in different capacities. By 97, I became full uh, part-time student of development studies. Mm -hmm. And that is where when I started reading uh, the uh, research uh, literature by uh, such scholars as uh, um, Roger Ballard, um, Rashmi Desai, uh, Vilayati Saifullah, um, John Rex, and uh, many, many others. And then new scholars like uh, Dr. Varinder Singh Kalra, and who also became my teacher, and my other teachers like Tariq Mahmood, Dalat Ali, and all these people, I learned from them. And Lala Arshad, my very close friend, and I, I, I also call him teacher in this respect, because they, Tarek, Dalit, and Lala Arshad came to this country in 68, 69, 70s, though as boys. So they seen the life from inside. And they told me uh, about all those uh, stories, uh, you know, how was life like and how did they work and, you know, what was the kind of different uh, issues happening here and challenges. So all these, from all these people, I learned different pieces of the migration story uh, of British Kashmiris. And that is what I'm going to tell you today. And I think it is very important to, uh, for that story to be told today. Because today, this march which is happening in London is organized by British Kashmiris. And while the idea of British Kashmiri was, I think, coined back in the 1990s, soon after, um, you know, this uh, uprising in the Indian controlled Kashmir in 1987. Uh, so the idea was coined here in Britain as well that we are Kashmiris people who come from the state of Jammu Kashmir in Britain, we are all Kashmiris. We are not Pakistanis, we are not Indians. Uh, but, but, but obviously, I think, it, and a lot of work, uh, I think, is done by different people, including myself, um, to have Kashmiri identity recognized in Britain at local and national level. Uh, but that is uh, details of uh, uh, that campaign, I will leave for some other time. Uh, but, but, but the point I'm trying to make today is that uh, uh, today is uh, the birth, the political birth of British Kashmiri idea. Uh, this idea is, uh, is being born today, um, politically, uh, that this scale of march is organized by British Kashmiris. So that is why it is very important to tell the story, because... Uh, and it's also important because there are a lot of misconceptions, a lot of misunderstandings, a lot of disinformation. Uh, and, and, and like I said, because we are told stories about ourselves, about our history, about our heritage, about our languages, about our uh, migration by the, Brit by the Pakistanis and Indians. So our story was never told. So that is why, and we have different stories. Like any nation, like any state, there is no one single story in the whole of the state. There are stories in different regions, and particularly because it's divided, and divided under military occupation. Therefore, uh, the, the, the story is used to be not let cross the division lines. People were kept uh, to their own uh, pockets. Uh, but Thanks to social media, the now stories are crossing uh, that line and many lines of TV uh, inside Kashmir and outside of uh, Kashmir amongst diaspora. So that is uh, um, uh, one interesting aspect of all this. So that is why it's, I think it's very important to tell the story of British Kashmiris today. And um, um, I, I can start with the first Kashmirian political. And usually uh, people, like I said, I used to believe that people came to Britain from Mirpur after Mangla Dam and because of Mangla Dam. And uh, the Pakistani government sent them over, helped them to uh, kind of uh, make their lives here. Uh, but obviously, this was one of the lies which I later discovered uh, that were uh, peddled without any basis. And when I asked people, they are not, I, I, I uh, have not met anybody who were given uh, 
any assistance uh, to migrate from Meetpur even after the dam. But the main thing was that I learned the first Kashmiri came to Britain in 1930, uh, sorry, 1830s, 1830s, not 1930s, 1830s, at least um, uh, about uh, one century and uh, um, about 25, 30 years before uh, the Mangla Dam uh, completion. So that, that was the first Kashmiri who, ca who came to Britain. And, and it was a woman. And she came from the Valley of Kashmir. And uh, her name was Nazir Begum. She was daughter of, uh, um, what was his name? Our, our father's name was, um, Thirty-four days. I have written somewhere. Ah, uh, yeah. She, she, she was Nazir Begum, uh, daughter of Nazir Jahan, and uh, she married to a colonial uh, army officer from Ireland. And um, her, uh, some of her belongings are still uh, in the uh, New Bridge house museum in Dublin, Ireland. And her husband was called uh, uh, Thomas Alexander Cobb. And he was born in 1788 and died in 1836. So th there is no mention of uh, her, uh, you know, exact date of her arrival to Britain. Uh, but, um, um, uh, but because he was... Uh, Uh, yeah, uh, but he was uh, um, um, he uh, he he was died in uh, 1836. So I assume that he obviously brought Nazir Begum, uh, his wife, his Kashmiri wife, uh, with him before 1836. So how long ago uh, before his death he brought her over is yet to be explored. And not much research is done. This information actually came to us from the book uh, Asians in Britain, written by Rosina Visram. So it's her book which carries these information and that's all. But from another book, which is written by Yusuf Saraf, uh, who was uh, originally from Kashmir Valley, um, uh, politically, he was uh, initially part of a national conference. I will tell you about that in uh, at a later stage. And then he changed to Muslim conference, and then he came to the Pakistani side of Kashmir in 1947, around that time. And then he was retired as chief justice of that part of Kashmir, which is commonly called uh, Azad Kashmir. And he wrote this book, Kashmiri's Fight for Freedom, uh, in 1970s, sometime after he retired, and it tells the story from very ancient time to 1970s. So it is a huge book and with um, loads of information. Obviously, is is analysis and is politics. We agree or disagree, but informations are very very useful. So in that book, uh, Yusuf Srav tells us the story of another Kashmiri woman uh, whose name was Jani. That's all um, uh, the, about her name. Uh, we know that Johnny. It was what was her full name? We don't know. And um, and according to Yusuf Sraf's uh, uh, story, he um, she came to Britain in 1830s. Again, uh, married to a British uh, colonial officer, uh, Robert Thorpe, Colonel Rod Robert Thorpe. And while he was uh, on holidays, why why these uh, two women married to British colonial officer? And I'm sure there there must be many more we don't know about because no research work is done on th these aspects of Asian and particularly Kashmiri life in Britain. Uh, so um, apart from Ro Rosina Vesram, who did a tremendous uh, work and a little, a kind of uh, digged out a lot of information, but there are so much more yet to be explored. So um, uh, 
I, they they were they you know because the valley of kashmir was uh, uh, the kind of favorite resort for uh, british colonial officers when they couldn't come to britain for holidays they used to go to uh, kashmir valley and shimla and these areas where the weather is obviously cold and uh, in summer it's it's just beautiful that's why uh, Kashmir was uh, uh, described by one of the Mughal em uh, emperors. Uh, uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, if there is heaven on earth, it is here in Kashmir. And obviously, perhaps you didn't see whole of the world at that time. There are perhaps more beautiful places than Kashmir as well. Uh, but Kashmir is one of those most beautiful places. So that is why it was a very favorite resort for British colonial officers. And here, uh, Colonel Robert Thorpe, uh, Yusuf Saab tells us, uh, fell in love with uh, Johnny on first sight. And uh, he um, said, I want to take this girl with me. But obviously, uh, her father, Daim Rator, uh, who, according to Yusuf Saab, was uh, the ruler of Kishtwar uh, state, uh, at that time, the, the modern state of Jammu Kashmir was not formed yet. We are talking about eight, eight, 1830s. And um, uh, so he uh, then asked his father, and his father said, you have to you know, convert uh, to become Muslim. Only then you can marry her. So he did that and then married her and brought her over to Britain. And about her, we know the, you know, the, some some more detail about uh, his uh, about her middle child who was also named uh, Thorpe and uh, Thorpe I don't know what was his first name but he was called kind of Thorpe Junior and he also joined army became uh, as a lieutenant he went to Kashmir which was uh, literally his motherland uh, so he went to Kashmir Valley and uh, there he became kind of very um, you know, he was shocked to see the state of, uh, uh, you know, conditions in which people were living in. And uh, so he became really involved uh, in uh, the issues of living in the valley. And he, I think his, his was the first uh, social study of that, uh, uh, you know, uh, part of Kashmir. Um, his uh, book, which was published uh, after his death in 1870, Kashmir misgoverned, gives a lot of details about how the state was run by, um, you know, the people who were, uh, when, when he went, it was all, of course, it was, a, uh, he went in the 1860s, so state was formed, and it was the Maharaja um, Rambir thing, I think, after Glab Singh, uh, who was ruling at that time. So, because of his writing, he was, uh, and he wrote in British papers and he wrote to British uh, um, rulers uh, that, you know, why, why, why you sold Kashmir to uh, this local ruler uh, who does not know how to govern. And uh, although, uh, you know, the governance at that time was not very much different in Britain, the particularly the condition of working class. And, and and the governance of British in India was now very humanly uh, for common people, but maybe the conditions were worse in the valley. That is why uh, he had to write this uh, uh, Lieutenant Robert Thorpe. Um, so, um, but but then Maharaja was told by British that this guy, what this guy is doing there. So because you were allowed only two months stay in. Uh, state of Jammu Kashmir and his two months were over so he, that was used to you know ask him to leave the state he did not uh, voluntarily so then he was uh, tied up with a cut you know the cot he was tied up with that and then he was uh, left outside of the Kashmir boundaries uh, but he sneaked back in and then um, uh, Yusuf Saraf tells us, and Father Bisco, who, whose book uh, Kashmir in uh, uh, Sunlight and Shade, Shade and Sunlight, uh, something like that, uh, who also confirms that he uh, Lieutenant uh, Thorpe's, uh, he was found dead on one morning in 1960, 1865, I think. 
And uh, there are a number of uh, a kind of uh, theories that how he was, uh, how uh, he was died, whether he was killed or was he died a natural death. So that was the story. And now uh, he, his grave is, is in Sirinagar. And on his uh, grave, it is written uh, that of, uh, your first kind of martyr for Kashmir cause or something, a uh, word of the nature. I don't have um, any image with me at the moment. Uh, uh, but I have seen uh, that image of the grave. And, um, uh, you know, so, so uh, now the, uh, the, the civil society of uh, Kashmir Valley, Jammu Kashmir civil society on the Indian side, they declared or announced one uh, award for, uh, um, you know, the people who work for human rights, and it's called Robert Thorpe Award. So, so, so it's kind of uh, that part of history has become um, kind of alive uh, recently in that part of Kashmir. And uh, so this was the second woman we know about who came to Britain. But the million Kashmiris today estimated, you know, recently when Guardian published an article and said that there are million Kashmiris in Britain. And from the academic research, it is very, it is established fact that about two thirds of uh, British Pakistanis actually uh, come from uh, uh, Kashmir. But they, but they were not kind of um, grown to this big number from those two women. Uh, this was a different stream of migration, started at a different time and from a different part of Kashmir for different purposes. This was in 1867, to be precise, exactly 100 years before Mangala Dam was built. Uh, the, the 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 place where it is Mangla Dam now, uh, this was a place uh, used for boat building, and that boat boat building industry existed for many many uh, thousand years. You know, it, it, it is one theory is that when Alexander came here, he um, the the people in that region were using, um, you know, the, these basic of boat, which is called Tala in our language, local language is called Tala, and it is basically made up of a, um, um, different, uh, you know, wood uh, from uh, trunks of different trees. Um, you know, they they are tied together and made a kind of platform, and that then you uh, stand on and um, row it uh, with with uh, you know different uh, shapes of woods. So that that was the basic uh, structure, and uh, um, and in, in 1867, uh, you know, th this industry was very um, kind of f f uh, you know um, very established industry, and hundreds of people were working in that, who were uh, building boats, and um, where Mangla is today, and then they used to take it across the river. It was river, river Purch and Jhelum, uh, I think they meet near there, and then go across Jhelum uh, city uh, from where uh, these boats were used to uh, take, um, you know, the transportation. They were used for transportation and uh, transportation purposes uh, from there to sea, um, you know, near Karachi through different rivers, because that was the only a mean of transport at that time available to people other than walking and ponies and you know uh, using animals but obviously they couldn't um, take uh, uh, you know heavy goods um, to from Jhelum to Karachi which is about 1000 miles so this was the only uh, main source of transportation mean of transportation but in 1867 when british introduced um, rail and it reached to Jhelum, the rail track and the rail this boat industry was obviously um, was to die down was to you know to to to, to, uh, to stop doing business because it was 
it was bound to go out of business because uh, train was uh, faster, cheaper, and safer. So therefore, this industry died down, and hundreds of people became uh, workless. And most of them, almost, you know, 98 percent, 90 percent were uh, uh, these workers were from Mirpur surrounding areas, particularly from Dadial and surrounding areas. And uh, so, what did they do um, to find work? They uh, actually um, used that train and went to different big cities of then British India, Karachi, Bombay, Kolkata, these areas. And that was the time when British introduced um, uh, uh, steamships, you know, rather than uh, sailing ships, they introduced steam engine uh, for ships. And in those, for, for, that, for that steam, uh, people have to work in the cold room. There was a special cold room in those new ships uh, where people have to uh, continuously um, feed the coal uh, to, the, to the engine for, for ships to keep moving. And it was very, very hot in that room, according to Roger Bollard. The, and, and this, by the way, this old story, I have uh, learned from Roger Bollard's writings. He is the guy who did all... Uh, more more research on uh, Kashmiris, British Kashmiris than anybody else. And uh, um, so, um, so in, in that uh, cold room, the temperature was very high. Uh, Ballard tells about from above 70 degrees centigrade. So that is why it was very difficult for uh, workers to work there for long uh, hours. So after a few days or few weeks, people used to leave that job. But these workers from Dadial area of Mirpur, um, of the then uh, state of Jammu Kashmir, they um, maybe they needed it very desperately, or they were strong people, or they were uh, from you know hot areas, you know whatever the reason was. Uh, but they stayed, and they when they stayed, the, the then the managers. I told them if you if you have more people you can bring them over so they became kind of uh, uh, recruiters as well for the ships and they were called srings and that's why we have so many srings in our area flan ring this ring that mr that ring they had actually uh, they use uh, they use this as their last name the you know their their profession so um so they they came back and recruited more boys and took them to the ship. So that is how it, 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 the kind of it, the, you know it, it became their monopoly. To, for, for 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 the so they became supervisors. Sling was kind of supervisor or foreman for that room, and uh, this is how they got there. And then later on, uh, nobody knows exactly when. Ballard says maybe closing years of the 19th century, I mean 1890s sometime, when people started leaving ships and they started looking for work inside British towns like Liverpool or if there was, you know, in Newcastle and those places. They they say there is a, a kind of a, um, um, there, there is no uh, kind of confirmation on dates, uh, and maybe if, if people do some deeper research, they probably find some papers or some evidence that when uh, people started leaving ships and working in uh, different places. But it is said that they worked as peddlers initially, selling things door to door or going to sell them in villages, and. Uh, so these were the earliest people. One friend in Birmingham, Birmingham, Mamtaz, uh, Khwaja Mamtaz, he told me that his grandfather, uh, Khwaja Kareem, if I remember the right name, uh, he came to uh, Britain. He was uh, Khwaja Kareem was uh, his nana, uh, and he came to Britain in uh, 1900. 
so these are kind of information are there in the community but obviously um, you know more research is required to establish the exact uh, you know dates and uh, times and issues so they uh, were the earliest workers in britain earliest kashmiri workers or labor migration started with those workers from tadial uh, in mirpur uh, that was part of jammu kashmir and now is in azad kashmir or azad jammu kashmir or pakistani administered kashmir or some people who would want complete independence of the whole state they would call all of this area as pakistani occupied kashmir and other area as indian occupied kashmir. But interestingly, Pakistani will call the other area as uh, Indian occupied Kashmir uh, or occupied Kashmir only. And this uh, they rarely mention. And the Indians would uh, uh, quickly call these areas as Pakistani occupied Kashmir POK. They call it POK. But they will not uh, call their own area uh, by that. Uh, you know, mentioning occupation, they will call it Jammu Kashmir state. They used to call it Jammu Kashmir state. Now, obviously, they reduced it to uh, Union territory. And uh, that is why all this, um, obviously, um, noise is being made. So, um, so I was telling you the story. And um, uh, yeah, so that is how the, the labor migration started uh, from the state of Jammu Kashmir to Britain in round about 1890s or early 1900. And uh, then when, you know, the First World War, they were about, uh, you know, nearly uh, 60, 70,000 soldiers from the state fighting in that war. And some of them, uh, people say they stayed back here. And uh, then the, after the uh, Second World War, some soldiers, uh, you know, uh, again, over 100,000 soldiers fought in the Second World War from Kashmir. My grandfather was in the, my, mater, uh, my paternal grandfather fought in the Second World War and my maternal grandfather fought in the First World War. Uh, so obviously it's a home story, but I never knew that till I came to Britain nobody no, nobody told us it was not taught in schools nothing uh, but anyway so that is the after the second world war then uh, british um, uh, you know obviously they were short uh, short of labor manual labor mainly or we can say the cheap labor because their own workers here by a uh, 1950s they became very aware of their rights and they they were obviously asking for high wages. And uh, so, they, the, you know, the, the owners of different mills and factories and, um, um, you know, construction uh, projects, they then uh, kind of uh, started uh, looking for labor uh, from former colonies. And uh, because these uh, uh, Kashmiris from Mirpur already were in Britain, So they, whenever they went back, uh, whoever of them did go, uh, they then told people. And gradually, the word was spread that uh, now the, um, uh, there is high demand for labor in Britain. So a lot of people who were still uh, working on ships uh, and uh, those who, um, you know, um, kind of had links with them, they started coming over to Britain. And by 1960s, there were a good few thousands of uh, Kashmiris in Britain working in different uh, factories and, uh, uh, you know, different projects. So, uh, and that is all before the Mangla Dam. Mangla Dam was kind of started in uh, early 1960, 62, 63. And by then, there were so many people, so the migration was going so fast that British government had to introduce the first immigration bill. Uh, so, so, the, so the people who, before that, they just come and started working and living anywhere. Now they had to have a proof that they have a job here. So they can't just come in. They have to have a, a evidence, a proof that they, are, uh, they, they, will, they, they will have a job here. 
so then you know obviously the people who are working in textile mills and foundries and you know buses and wherever they then kind of uh, started uh, getting vouchers for them uh, before um, and a lot of people came before the impl implementation of this uh, 1962 immigration act uh, to beat uh, the the restrictions so a lot of people came before that but then after that it was still not uh, impossible i mean it was relatively difficult but people did get the vouchers and there was a lot of work available so that that is how the more that is how more people uh, join in by 1970s you know the one uh, uh, typical feature of kashmiri community british kashmiri community which i uh, became aware of through my research and um, through my conversations with uh, people who were here in uh, 1960 late 60s and 1970s early 70s is that our our uh, uh, it was more widespread amongst british kashmiri community that we will not stay here we will work for 5 year 10 year then we'll go back so there is no point bringing over families and uh, um and and also i think it was because of their conservative uh, uh, outlook uh, in terms of outside of the culture they thought it was quite quite difficult for them to take their wives and children outside of their comfort uh, cultural zone so therefore uh, um they they thought no we will work and we'll go back and we'll start our lives there we're not going to stay here but obviously the way uh, things happened were going to happen uh, it was not in their control so um, it it was they couldn't they couldn't manage to earn enough money uh, to go back so they thought okay we'll stay two more years three more years and then there were new rules introduced that young people can come only with their Uh, children under 16 can come only with their mums and because a lot of people were thinking that they will invite their uh, young boys over who will work and then they will go back because two people will be working with we'll more money and then will go back but obviously when this with the new law they had to invite their wives over as well uh, so then the, the wives started coming over so family started being created in britain and then in the um, 1980s when you know wives came over uh, husbands were already here their father and mothers you know grown old and no there was nobody to look after them so then they were brought over as well and then marriages started taking place so that is how uh, the, the 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 population was grown uh, of british kashmiris and obviously this is not because i'm focusing on british kashmiris i'm telling british kashmiri story for the first time maybe that's why i'm focusing on this i mean this, this these processes happened in all most all migrant communities in to different degrees at different levels um you know in different shapes and forms but they all the, the settlement process was generally like this so today uh, there are four generation of uh, kashmiris living in uh, you know in some cases still in the same one house but in many cases now they are living in different ha homes maybe in the same street or in the same town so obviously that social change is happening but slowly so um so that is how this uh, british kashmiri community was formed from azad kashmir area and uh, they are primarily from meetpur uh, and uh, but recently Uh, there is a migration has taken place from ravalakot punch muzaffarabad uh, those areas when i say mirpur that means bimber and kotli because at that time bimber and kotli were part of mirpur district but now kotli is separate district bimber is separate district but now they are part of mirpur division so there are three divisions in azad kashmir mirpur division muzaffarabad division and punch division so now people from punch and muzaffarabad we also uh, have uh, migrated to britain but they are mainly young people educated um, you know university at least university level and uh, you know some doing business and some doing different jobs and they you know some of them uh, have brought their families over as well 
so there are there there is this uh, um, this is the composition from azad kashmir side or the pakistani administered kashmir side from the indian administered side uh, there is also um, about at least about 5000 5 to 7000 there is no real calculation of population from the indian side or pakistani side so there are estimates uh, so um, uh, from the indian side uh, the, it is estimated that there are about uh, 5 to 7000 uh, kashmiris uh, from the valley mainly from the valley area but there are some people from the jammu um, uh, province as well and uh, and i think maybe few from gilgit baltistan part of the uh, state uh, so but, but the people from the valley of kashmir started coming to britain in uh, late 50s and early 60s i think uh, and they were mainly the professionals mainly the doctors and some are lawyers and some are in other high professions uh, so therefore the people uh, of kashmiri heritage from the valley of kashmir who are uh, settled in britain and who, who form the part of wider british kashmiri diaspora uh, are um, you know belong to a different kind of uh, uh, you can say social strata or class you can say um, and, and that is uh, why there is uh, uh, there, there there is certain distance uh, between the Kashmiris from that side and this side and obviously you know not only different class but obviously they have different perceptions of uh, Kashmir as well uh, you know the, the people who from other side they had a different perception from the but now the way things they have changed over the last 30 years they have become very close and very interactive and they are trying to understand each other's uh, um, understandings and perspectives so 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 is that is happening now right now and because of that there sometimes there are discussions sometimes there are differences sometimes there are debates and one uh, and uh, so so this is the story of british kashmiris and today there are estimated about 1 million nearly 1 million kashmiris in britain because the total population of pakistanis in census is over you know about nearly 1200000 and uh, um, and and because there is there are it is people claim that there are many Kashmiris who are not counted, don't fill in the census form. So uh, there are a lot of uh, obviously that's a whole different subject area. Uh, but generally, numerically, this is the number of Kashmiris in Britain, and then there are um, obviously nearly two million Indians in Britain. So overall, the people from South Asian region are more than 3 million in Britain, about, about maybe 3.5 million or something. So um, huge population that directly gets affected by what happens inside Kashmir or between India and Pakistan. So that's why it's very important for everybody to understand uh, that, uh, um, you know, the, 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 what are the issues? What, and, and in this case, what exactly is the Kashmir problem? What exactly is the Kashmir question? And uh, and why, I mean, why these uh, protests are happening? And uh, what are the differences between, uh, uh, you know, different uh, uh, communities and what are the viewpoints and what are the commonalities? So all these are very important uh, aspects, but I will focus today only on uh, the Kashmir question, that how it was born. But I will come back in about five, ten minutes, ten minutes, and then uh, I will talk about uh, the Kashmir question.
Hi, welcome back. And um, now uh, the, the protest has been started and uh, it is uh, it has been uh, streamed uh, from one of our reporters, Faz, Mohammed Faz from uh, the Parliament Square in uh, uh, Britain. And uh, uh, he is streaming it live. So, uh, uh, and if I can get connected with him, um, I will ask uh, him what's going on there. And um, so um, th the protest will start from Parliament Square and then it will walk uh, uh, towards Downing Street where a petition uh, is expected to be handed uh, in by uh, the Prime Minister of uh, Azad Kashmir, Azad Jammu Kashmir, as his full name, and um, um, Raja Farooq Hadar, he is the current prime minister of uh, that part, uh, which is administered by Pakistan, but it has its uh, autonomous uh, government uh, with all uh, the actually symbols of uh, a government, prime minister, president, and supreme court, and all that but control the powers actually this this government has limited powers uh, it is not properly um represented government even uh, there as well because the people who uh, are not uh, supporting kashmir's accession to pakistan they cannot participate in elections in this part of kashmir so baba is partially represented uh, the government is elected by local people and um, uh, so, so is Prime Minister Farooq Adar, who is also part of this march, and ex-Prime Minister Barrister Sultan Mahmood is also participating in this march. Uh, so they will uh, hand over a petition uh, to British uh, government uh, at Downing Street, and then from there they will uh, march towards the Indian embassy, and it will end uh, there uh, by 4.30 today. So and for next three, four hours, people will be, you know, marching and uh, shouting slogans. Um, and particularly the focus today is uh, about uh, the curfew, which was imposed on uh, 5th of August by the government of uh, India, led by BJP, the Bharti Janta Party. And uh, it was they, they unilaterally um, demoted the state of Jammu Kashmir under their control from a state to a union territory and also divided it into two parts. Uh, one is um, um, composed of Jammu and Kashmir areas. Uh, they will have a legislative assembly and uh, Ladakh area of the state uh, is uh, um, given a union territory status without uh, assembly. So this and this will, um, from their point of view, this this will be implemented in August, uh, in October, and um, from then on, uh, it will not be a state anymore. It will be a union territory, uh, and uh, because of uh, that, uh, there is there is a, another uh, article in the Indian Constitution uh, called 35A. And uh, uh, that has also been abolished, and uh, that is resisted by not only the people in the Valley of Kashmir, but outside areas like in Pir Punjal and Jammu and Ladakh. A lot of people are not um, happy about this, and they are protesting. And the curfew is also imposed in those areas of Pir Punjal and some part of Jammu, and in Kargil area of Ladakh. So that that is uh, the situation uh, there, and that is the, all the protest is about. Uh, you know, the the, the twenty eight did uh, twenty eight days of curfew. Um, you know, around the clock curfew, st very uh, strict curfew, and there is um, there was al already about five hundred thousand uh, uh, troops uh, in the in the Kashmir Valley and surrounding areas, and nearly one hundred. Uh, uh, thousand m more deployed uh, since fourth uh, of August. So uh, nearly six hundred thousand army. There, the total population of uh, Kashmir Valley is nearly uh, uh, ten million, 
and then uh, in the other parts uh, <clears throat> you can say that there are uh, um, total population is nearly um, 15 to 16 million in the indian side of kashmir and uh, the rest is in the pakistan so, so total population of the state is around um, 20 million uh, today so um, but the people in the indian side of kashmir are suffering most and uh, this is uh, happening since 1987 when a uprising was uh, erupted in the kashmir valley um, when the elections in which a uh, um, alliance of different uh, social political and uh, religious organizations formed muslim united front and they wanted to participate in election they did participate in election but uh, uh, though the elections were very heavily rigged and that is documented by different indian journalists uh, you know the level uh, and the methods of rigging uh, were uh, you know explained in detail how uh, the, those elections were rigged to keep the muslim united front out of the jammu kashmir assembly because they were not uh, um, supportive of uh, the indian uh, constitution and the kashmir being part of india they were asking for self determination so that is why they, they 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 every method was used to keep them out of the assembly and against that rigging when people started uh, protesting uh, then it was uh, the gun was introduced and then it became a kind of armed rebellion and uh, the clashes with the indian army started um, in those years continued throughout today at different degrees and uh, it is estimated that nearly 100,000 people have been killed since then in the indian side of kashmir so that that is why when uh, people talk about the pakistani side of kashmir when i talk about pakistani side of kashmir and uh, i don't uh, when i say that it is uh, about the kashmiri people the state subjects a lot of people uh, who have uh, only heard one narrative that it is a muslim question they obviously become quite upset and they uh, accuse uh, people like myself and this tv channel that we have a special agenda you can see in the comments that we have a special agenda and we want to divide muslims so obviously there are uh, different perspectives like in any society there are different perspectives uh, about the history about the kashmir question how it was born and what it is and uh, what is the way forward so there are different uh, uh, kind of um, issues and questions and uh, not only within kashmiris but uh, the pakistanis and indians if you read their comments they also have uh, um, uh, you know they they also have uh, uh, you know the views that the indians would uh, like the world to believe the Kashmir is a part of India and Pakistan is meddling in their internal matters and the Pakistani would like to uh, like the world to believe that actually this uh, Kashmir is Kashmir belongs to Pakistan and uh, because it is a Muslim majority state and Indians have uh, um, taken it over uh, illegally and their occupation is uh, illegal so but, but the Kashmiris those Kashmiris who um, see it, uh, you know, as a Kashmir question. Uh, they see both Indian and Pakistani armies uh, illegal in in the state, and they want both of them to leave Kashmir, demilitarize it, and then let people decide. So historically, it was, you know, people mean that all state subjects should decide collectively the about the future of the whole state. But now, because there are different views in different regions there is also demand that different regions should be given a right to decide their future if they want to stay with the state or they want to go with india or they want to go with pakistan so these are different uh, kind of uh, um, um, suggestions or you can say demands made by different people uh, uh, in, in in different regions of uh, the state of jammu kashmir now how this uh, question was actually born why why kashmir became a problem from jammu kashmir state it became to um, be known as kashmir problem uh, all over the world 
So that is something which uh, uh, I would uh, uh, tell you briefly about. And uh, if and when we can link up with uh, our reporters uh, on the ground, uh, we will, um, uh, you know, show you the protest. And now somebody's yes, Javed. Wal Islam. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm live. And uh, are you at uh, at the demo? Okay, I have sent you the link, and if you please link up if you can, if if there is a enough st signal strength, so pre try to link up, and uh, we can talk. Thank you, thank you very much. So we are trying to link up, and if we do, then we we will show you uh, the protest because at the moment, like I said, there is one contingent people of you know gathered in the parliament square. Uh, and uh, the other uh, lot are uh, at Downing Street. And the people from Parliament Square, to uh, they will walk towards Downing Street and from there to uh, the Indian Embassy. That, the, that is the plan. And uh, uh, so um, I, I was... Uh, I was talking about, the, you know, how, how this uh, Kashmir problem was born. And um, from from the Kashmiri perspective, from the state perspective, um, it, it it was born uh, out of um, uh, you know the invasions, several invasions which were uh, carried out by Indians and Pakistanis in uh, 1947. Uh, to be precise, on uh, um, 22nd of October 1947. But before that. Uh, from 15th of August 1947 to 22nd of October 1947, uh, Kashmir was an independent state. It was not part of India. It was not part of Pakistan. And the reason was that Kashmir was one of uh, 600 princely states. Because, uh, you know, during the British rule, the whole of uh, subcontinent was um, uh, organized into two administrative setups. One was called British India, and that was directly controlled and ruled by British. And the second uh, was uh, uh, called princely India, and that was uh, ruled through different rulers, uh, princes, um, or kings, or nawabs, and marajas. Um, these 600 states were um, ruled by local Nawabs and Maharajas, but they all were, uh, they had uh, signed different treaties with British Crown, uh, but the, internally they were autonomous. So Jammu Kashmir was one of those states, and it was largest of uh, the states, and with more mixed population. Um, and when the British left, uh, when they decided that we will leave India uh, and uh, divide the British India into two dominions or two states, uh, the Indian uh, uh, state and the Pakistani state, the, the principle uh, uh, they uh, devised to, de to do this uh, division or partition uh, was uh, based on the principle of uh, uh, basically religious affiliations. Uh, it was uh, given, you know, the people, it, it was decided that areas with the Muslim majority that will become Pakistan and areas with other communities that will become India. Um, so um, on 14th and 15th of August 1947, uh, India and Pakistan were born. Pakistan was born on 14th and India 15th. So, um, but, but these 600 states, there, there was different principle divided for them. And uh, although generally it was in line with the religious uh, um, uh, composition, uh, but the right was given to the rulers that they will decide um, if they want to go with India or if they want to go with Pakistan. But there was also provision for them to stay independent if they want to. Uh, there was no uh, uh, 
restriction uh, on them that they cannot become although they were advised by the british uh, um, um viceroy lord mount batten and uh, that they should uh, when they make decision these uh, princes or rulers of the state when they make decision they should uh, keep in mind the composition of uh, their populations and their geographical uh, location as well because uh, some of these states were very small um, you know maybe one mile uh, square yard and uh, with few hundred or few thousand population and they were uh, located very deep into what became india or pakistan and uh, but there were other states which were quite large quite affluent and uh, uh, but again their location was quite important and and religious composition so by, by uh, 15th of august 1980 uh, 1947 uh, all state decided uh, if they want to go with india or pakistan uh, apart from uh, three uh, states the junagar and uh, hyderabad and jammu kashmir hyderabad rulers uh, de declared that they want to uh, remain independent. Junagar, which was not uh, geographically um, linked with Pakistan, um, uh, declared that they want to join Pakistan. And Jammu Kashmir uh, ruler uh, clearly indicated that uh, he will um, keep the existing arrangements at, as they were with British. Uh, they will keep it and they call it standstill agreement that uh, communication defense uh, and um, um, foreign affairs will be uh, managed by india and pakistan but the rest uh, of the uh, rest of the affairs will be internally managed by the ruler and uh, and pakistan actually signed that agreement on 12th of august 1947 but india asked for more time so uh, this was the situation and um, um, but after uh, 15th of august um, then things changed but what was happening within the jammu kashmir state um, at nine uh, in 19 you know uh, in 1947 there, there was a people's movement uh, in kashmir was the only state of all these uh, 600 states where uh, you know the the popular politics or modern politics was quite advanced there were three major political parties existed uh, inside the state of jammu kashmir at that time um, uh, and 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 these party was born out of a people's uh, uh, politics, uh, or what you can be call, what you can call popular politics, uh, in 1930s. That was initiated in 1930s, and uh, it was uh, um, this popular movement from which the first political party of Kashmiri history was born. And it was named as All Jammu Kashmir Muslim Conference. And uh, the reason it was uh, uh, named All Jammu Kashmir Muslim Conference because uh, the majority of population in the state was Muslim, but it was also that population which was uh, um, kind of uh, more excluded or left out, or they had uh, fewer rights. And, uh, you know, they were peasants, they were workers, and they were from the lower strata of the society. And although there were some Hindus and Sikhs and Christians and Buddhists who were also not uh, um, part of the ruling uh, elite, uh, so they were also suffering economic hardships and uh, suppression. Uh, but uh, because majority of these uh, people who uh, started this uh, uh, popular resistance or popular movement and they were muslim so therefore their leadership uh, was uh, uh, quite uh, uh, quick to name it a muslim conference and and also because there were other um, organizations of other religious communities um, um, you know the, the pandits the hindu dogras they have their own organizations the sikhs have their, their own organizations Buddhists have their organizations, uh, but but Muslims 
also had some uh, organizations like that, but this was first political organization, uh, and they called it Muslim Conference. So it was uh, at that time seen as more, more most appropriate way to go about. But soon there was debates within the Muslim Conference that um, are we are we just uh, going to uh, have Muslims in our party, or is, is this going to be representative of the whole state? And then gradually these debates uh, were uh, intensified, and uh, different uh, um, after very, so many debates and meetings um, in 1939. Then the final decision was taken within the party that uh, uh, we should change the name of Muslim Conference to National Conference, Jammu Kishmir National Conference, so that uh, people from other communities can also be part of uh, this uh, struggle. And that struggle was very clearly against the autocratic rule of Maharaja. And at that time, Maharaja was Hari Singh, uh, the fourth uh, uh, kind of higher of uh, are the are the fourth generation of Maharaja Gulab Singh, who uh, formed this whole state of Jammu Kashmir and uh, who signed a treaty with the British East India Company on 16th of March 1846, uh, in which uh, British East India Company um, recognized his uh, right to govern uh, this uh, whole state uh, and. Uh, and it was the 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 the, the wording uh, of article number one of that treaty is that uh, this uh, whole state is given in the independent possession of uh, Maharaja in his male body hairs uh, forever. So that was the wording of that uh, treaty. So this state uh, was ruled by um, his uh, great grandson uh, Hari Singh. And uh, um, Hari Singh obviously was a relatively modern uh, prince and who uh, was uh, kind of trained in Britain. And he said when he, uh, when he was uh, crowned, when he took the charge of the state, he said, my religion will be justice. So he had some modern uh, ways of uh, saying things. Uh, uh, but practically, um, his uh, uh, state structure was very suppressive for uh, people uh, with uh, less uh, lands or the workers and the poor uh, masses. And also it has some discriminatory laws against Muslims. So all these factors uh, were in play when the popular politics was taking birth in the state of Jammu Kashmir in 1930s. But by 1947, there were three political parties already in existence. Like I said, Muslim Conference was changed into National Conference, and that was the largest party of the state. But uh, uh, gradually then, the, some people in the Muslim con uh, National Conference, they were not happy with the style of uh, his leader, Sheikh Abdullah. And, uh, all, and, and, and they were also not happy that uh, National Conference was uh, uh, getting closer and closer to Indian National Congress. So they formed or they, can, they, they, they reformed the Muslim Conference in 1942. And in 1944, the third uh, party was uh, born and that was called Jammu Kashmir Mazdoor Kassan Conference, Workers and Peasants Party. And uh, that was formed by uh, some uh, peasant activist leaders uh, from Kashmir Valley and uh, the, who, who were mainly popular in rural areas. And uh, the, some, uh, uh, you know, uh, city um, intellectuals like uh, Premnak Bazaars, who were very uh, fond of human socialism, the humanism, they called it, and they, they called it, at, at other places, they called it socialism. So they were clearly have these ideas. While the two uh, major parties, uh, National Conference and Muslim Conference, they were uh, uh, happy to keep Maharaja Hari Singh as the figurehead of the state, but they were both demanding for multi-party, multi-party, 
uh, political system and they 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 were uh, uh, asking for uh, um adult uh, you know normal election democracy the people should elect their uh, members you know uh, in the assembly and then uh, that assembly should govern the state with maharaja as figure at so what you can call constitutional monarchy or whatever you want to call it that they they both were um, happy with that um, and, and and there is a lot of evidence uh, on uh, this uh, the most uh, um, kind of uh, concrete evidence is uh, the new kashmir manifesto which was presented by national conference in 1944 uh, in which it was uh, all the languages of the state were recognized and uh, all the religious and regional identities were recognized and maharaja was um, accepted as uh, the figure head uh, of the state and and the national and the muslim conference also um, um, presented this azad kashmir resolution um, some some years after that i think it was uh, 1944 uh, four or five Uh, where they also asked for a assembly and uh, elected assembly fully elected assembly and uh, maharaja as figure head so they categorically said that maharaja should not accede to india or pakistan but remain independent with a full fledged democratic uh, government and uh, Uh, so this this was the situation in the state of jammu kashmir and there was an assembly introduced by maharaja in 1934 just two years after the major uprising and uh, at the formation of uh, muslim conference and and that uh, famous um, ma- massacre of 21 people on 13th of july 1931 so so this so this assembly was introduced in 1934 uh, initially less than 50% uh, members were to be elected and the rest were appointed by maharaja and then in the next election that was uh, taken place in around 1938 39 uh, more than 50% were elected and it was uh, quite a kind of uh, it was heading towards a fully elected assembly so if you look at uh, uh, the processes within the state um, without any um, lenses given by indians or pakistanis um, then you can see that there there was some kind of consensus developing actually uh, maharaja was evolving his assembly uh, to elected assembly and in uh, national conference and muslim conference were asking for that So, so there was no major clash between Maharaja and Muslim Conference and National Conference uh, till 1946. In 1946, something happened which uh, uh, divided or which kind of laid the foundation for future division of the Kashmir. This was Quit Kashmir movement. that was launched in 1946 and uh, this was uh, led by sheikh mohammed abdullah who was seen as most popular leader of the state more popular in the kashmir valley but also uh, fairly popular in jammu province and uh, uh, in ladakh and gilgit baltistan the political kind of participation was low anyway but uh, he had some supporters there as well and in maharaja's assembly there were people uh, from uh, ladakh and uh, gilgit baltistan as well uh, so so it was the whole the, the political uh, kind of a structure that was evolving it was for the whole state it was not just for the valley of kashmir or jammu it was for the entire state and it was during these periods which um, um, you know the, the 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 term kashmir became political rather than cultural historically it was cultural uh, and it was confined to kashmir valley uh, and was linked with kosher language uh, but ob- obviously within kashmir valley kosher is not the only language that is spoken there are uh, there is pari is spoken gojri spoken 
so uh, but over uh, all it was linked with the kosher language and kosher culture and kashmir valley but, 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 but through this popular politics it evolved into political identity and that was then became kind of um, synonymous with the whole state although the full name of uh, the state was when it was formed uh, uh, on 16th of march 1846 uh, the full name given to it by the ruler was jammu and kashmir and tibbat ha and aksai chan and territories that was the full name but gradually the name that evolved the two names that evolved actually to to to, to represent uh, the whole state uh, were jammu kashmir or kashmir only kashmir so this this was happening within the state um, uh, before india and pakistan invaded and took over by but, but like i said there was one particular juncture uh, or point in the history that uh, disintegrated this process and that was quit kashmir movement uh, launched by sheikh abdullah uh, head of national conference at that time and uh, in the reason i am saying that uh, quit kashmir was uh, uh, the start of disintegration of the uh, uh, state uh, is uh, because the memorandum Sheikh Abdullah presented to a British delegation that visited uh, uh, Kashmir in 46. In that memorandum, it said that uh, Kashmir is not only a geographical area, but is a, a, a land with one culture and one language. So obviously, this was a clear deviation from New Kashmir Manifesto, which was also presented by National Conference, although headed by Sardar Bud Singh at that time. So, in the new, while in New Kashmir, the whole state was recognized, all the languages, all the cultures, and um, the whole state was recognized as Kashmir state. Uh, but in the Quit Kashmir Memorandum, it was valley, the, the the land with one language and one culture, and obviously then gradually things uh, uh, changed and. Uh, Muslim conference was confused whether to support quit Kashmir or not. And they were advised by Khaid Azam, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan. And um, this is told by the then acting general secretary of Muslim conference, who was general, who was appointed acting general secretary in 1946. When Kashmir, Kashmir movement was started, the leadership of Muslim conference was also arrested along with the national conference. So this acting secretary and actor, acting president went to Qaeda Azam and asked for his advice. And he said, you stand with Maharaja for independent Kashmir because quit Kashmir is not a right move. It will not help the state. So this, uh, as per this advice, then they stood with Maharaja and asked for independent Kashmir. But obviously, things gradually changed. And uh, when Maharaja did not decide to join India or Pakistan on 14th and 15th of August, Kashmir became independent with an assembly that was more than 50 percent elected and with two parties who were um, uh, who gave their uh, acceptance to the um, constitutional monarchy. Uh, but, but after 15th August, things uh, rapidly changed and there was a rebellion in Poonch area of Poonch area, which is in Pakistani control now, not because Poonch was a, a whole uh, uh, kind of uh, region within the state, uh, which was a mix uh, of different uh, uh, religious and uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, social communities, but only some communities which were Muslim and predominantly uh, represented by the, the areas uh, in the areas which came under Pakistani control, they rebelled and then they, there was a kind of pro-Pakistan movement and then there was a pro-India movement. So from then on, Kashmir polit Kashmiri politics divided between uh, pro-Indian and pro-Pakistanis. And the, the, you know, the, the pro-independence element did not exist at that time. 
you know after these uh, after 15th of august before 15th august it was all pro independence but after that they they changed positions because they thought um you know you know we we can't remain independent now so they uh, kind of moved closer to their ideological um um uh, you know, you know, there are the you know ideological bases. You can say are, uh, you know, the Muslim Conference shifted towards Muslim League of Pakistan, the founding party of Pakistan, and National Conference uh, moved closer to uh, the Indian National Congress, uh, that was uh, the founding party of of India. So, and then. Maharaja, because he didn't decide to uh, join any uh, of the states, uh, uh, but, but signed a standstill agreement with Pakistan. Therefore, um, uh, it, you know, it, 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 he expected that he will remain autonomous. But obviously, this did not happen. And the, the Pakistanis sent uh, tribals to help uh, the local people who they claim were struggling uh, against Maharaja and Maharaja was going to massacre them. So therefore, they sent tribal uh, gangs or tribal uh, groups um, to, to, to Kashmir. And they then they started killing uh, non-Muslims in Mirpur, Mazafrabad and Punch areas. And uh, then Maharaja asked India for help. And then in Mount Batten, who was still uh, in charge of affairs, um, he then put this condition to Maharaja that he has to sign uh, the document of accession uh, with India. Only then they can send uh, their armies. So he did that, and then army was sent. Obviously, there are a lot of academic uh, debates and um, uh, contesting uh, arguments uh, about uh, certain aspects, but this is the general story I'm telling you. And uh, so, so then uh, Indian Army came, and then a huge massacre took place in Jammu of Muslims. Uh, it is said that from 20, you know, the figures, different figures have come up from 20,000 to 200,000. And similarly, there are different figures uh, quoted by different writers uh, about the Mirpur and Muzaffarabad. There is no proper uh, research has carried out uh, on the numbers of people uh, got killed and how. Although there are some memoirs of people uh, who, who were survivors of those ma massacres in Jammu and Mirpur, um, from where you can get some picture that how um, you know horrifying. Uh, these massacres were and what kind of atrocities were committed against uh, the people of state um, at that time uh, you know there is there is a there are claims that the jammu massacre was actually masterminded by the by the state um, while here on this side it was kind of um, by the tribals and some local people uh, so so obviously there's a huge subject on which there are some studies have started coming out and the people who are interested, they can, you know, if you just Google a Jammu massacre and Mirpur massacre or Muzaffarabad, and you will find the uh, li li literature on this. Uh, so, so this is what when this all started, then obviously in Pakistani army went in as well. So, uh, it became a full fledged kind of war between Pakistani armies and Indian army. And then India took the matter to United Nations on 1st of January 1948. And that is where it was all debated between India and initially. And, the, and very interesting uh, aspects of uh, this uh, story uh, that when it was taken there, it was uh, called uh, Jammu Kashmir question. But then soon it was changed into India-Pakistan question. And because Kashmiris were not represented in the, at the United Nations, so it was between the Indians, Pakistani rulers, and the world rulers who were members of the United Nations. So it was changed from Jammu Kashmir question to India-Pakistan question at United Nations. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm still uh, waiting if somebody joined me, but, you know, till somebody does that, I will continue with the story. And uh, 
so there there were a lot of resolutions the commission was set up many resolutions were passed and and the summary of that is uh, that uh, um, it was agreed by india and pakistan that uh, there will be a referendum in the state of jammu kashmir after um, you know initially it was said on the uh, uh, resolution in the resolution that was passed on 13th of august 1948 that first the all pakistani army will leave and all people um, uh, all pakistani citizens who entered the state for the purpose of fighting they will leave and once that is established that all of the pakistani army and uh, uh the the uh, the tribals or anybody else who came for the purpose of fighting when it established that they have left then india will take bulk of its army out and the remaining army will help with the administration of referendum and all that initially pakistan accepted that but later on uh, there were uh, issues uh, risen uh, and uh, pakistanis uh, objected that if there is no pakistani army then you know only indian army then that will not be a fair referendum so that kind of arguments came up and then it was decided in i think in 1953 that uh, okay uh, leave about 6000 of pakistani army is about 8 9000 of indian army and that was then kind of final agreement but they never withdrew their armies Pakistan did not withdraw with uh, with the drawn its army India did not withdraw withdraw its army so therefore uh, this matter continued and nobody actually um, seriously pushed them for a referendum and uh, and within Kashmir I think they, this was a perfect division I always call it perfect division when I read about all that and I thought this was a perfect division because there was the areas which came under pakistani uh, control they were all pro pakistani they wanted to join pakistan the majority of those people were and uh, the areas which went uh, under um, indian control they were predominantly for india national conference the largest party led by sheikh abdullah uh, they actually resisted the uh, tribals and uh, from pakistan they formed their own malaysia and they fought against that and jammu predominantly hindu area and what happened in mirpur uh, obviously they were for india and uh, ladakh uh, was also not for pakistan or for india. there was no uh, the, the concept of independent kashmir was do- basically done away with uh, by then so it was a clear uh, positioning of pro india and pro pakistani and this division was perfect there was no um resistance uh, any significant resistance to this division so that is that was done that was done and dusted and it it appeared that is concluded uh, and, and maybe that is one reason that the world did not take any serious uh, steps for referendum uh, to take place because there was no resistance from people on the ground so that is why it continued uh, for some time but things were not really right on the ground at the micro level things were happening on both sides of line of control and um, uh, but but both sides were kept kind of under tight control uh, on on the pakistani side it we we grown up with the, this uh, understanding that kashmir is very sensitive area our areas you know azad kashmir uh, just above the mirpur it was all kind of seen as sensitive areas because there is a ceasefire line there and on this side there is a pakistani army on other side there is indian army so it was the, the region was basically um, on both sides it, it it was it was seen as kind of sensitive area and any deviation any um political um, views which were not uh, um, conformist to the indian and pakistani positions were seen as um, um, you know they, they were seriously suspected and uh, people were questioned and people were uh, people were um, kind of accused that uh, you know if if they are taking some money from other side so that is why they are 
using this language or that's why they are not that's why they are critical of the indian uh, control or pakistani control uh, in the, in these areas there were only few people very few initially uh, for example in mirpur you know in the pakistani administration kashmir it was only in mirpur where there was a small pocket of national conference activists uh, national conference um, was uh, quite uh, um, you know there, there are there are many activists of national conference in mirpur before 47 but after division most of them uh, were you know kind of they had to leave um, because of these communal uh, issues so um, Krishan Dev Sethi is one of them who is still alive and is uh, in Jammu and he always uh, write uh, the whole truth. He, all, he always write uh, what happened and uh, how the, um, you know, this uh, this movement was started in 31, 32. And all, uh, you know, there was huge movement in Mirpur against the revenue uh, kind of uh, laws, um, you know, the, the increase in revenue on land. And uh, this movement was very um, uh, popular, and Maharaja forces could not handle it, so they had to uh, invite the British army, who went in the leadership of Major Salisbury in 1932, sometime, and then they kind of crushed, or crushed this movement. And uh, two people were hanged uh, in Mirpur in 1932. Uh, one was. Um, uh, Batahan and one was uh, Subha Sadak, I think his name was. So these two people were hanged and then many, many were given long sentence uh, at Bahu Fort and other uh, prisons. So oh, this, his, this chapter of Mirpur history is usually not um, uh, included in the general uh, writing on Kashmir. And uh, um, only few uh, references uh, can be found. One is in, obviously the files in the British India Office Library, and other source is uh, Krishan Dev Sethi himself, who who who, who witnessed uh, or who was uh, uh, told by uh, people uh, who were part of uh, that movement. So therefore, in Mirpur, there was this pocket of a national conference type uh, with secular uh, outlook and. Uh, uh, this uh, they, they were not in favor of Kashmir joining India and or, or Pakistan, but they were in very small numbers. The predominant sport in these areas was for Muslim conference, and the Muslim conference was in in power. So all these voices were has to be whisp whispered. Any any loud uh, talk of independence was dealt with very severely. And uh, there are there are people like uh, Comrade Muhammad Hussain and uh, several other, Abdul Khalik Ansari, who were arrested and uh, who were humiliated. And uh, Abdul Khalik Ansari has written in detail in his autobiography and in some of his articles that how the environment was then. Uh, so, 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 but they were in, in a very small numbers. Similarly, on Indian side, uh, there was a small pocket of pro-Pakistanis who wanted to join Pakistan. And uh, this was around uh, the Mirwaz and some other um, uh, activists of Muslim conference. And uh, then obviously Jamaat Islami formed as well. But, but they, they, there was that small pocket on the Indian side. So numerically, they didn't matter in 1947. Numerically, it was a perfect division of the state of Jammu Kashmir. And uh, had India and Pakistan decided that, uh, you know, to, 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 to turn the ceasefire line into international border, perhaps there would have been no uh, resistance from people of Kashmir. Uh, but internationally, maybe that was not possible because there was resolution, there were resolutions. So they, 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 they kind of adopted the approach of uh, uh, ignoring it. Uh, ignoring the forgetting about the referendum, although Pakistan is kept kind of raising it at different stage, stages, but uh, Indians by 1960s they changed their policy and they said they started um, claiming that it is uh, integral part of India. Kashmir is integral part of India, and there is no need for referendum. There are elections there happened in the local assembly, and the people have decided, and so so Kashmir is part of India. But obviously, an autonomous part. 
because there was autonomy granted to the Indian side of Kashmir in the Indian constitution. And uh, that, uh, that is why there was a constituent assembly inside the Jammu Kashmir and uh, that adopted its own constitution. So this was a constitutional arrangement between India and Pakistan that there will be uh, autonomy. So only uh, communication, uh, defense and foreign affairs will be dealt by uh, with by India and the rest uh, in, in the rest of the matters state of Jammu Kashmir and Ladakh will be autonomous state. And similarly, like I said, Azad Kashmir and Gil Azad Kashmir was certainly uh, given a kind of a numerical uh, or uh, nominal autonomy, uh, all full autonomy in name, but in practice, it everybody who grown grown up there knows that what kind of uh, power uh, our rulers have, Azad Kashmiri rulers. Um, if if Pakistani want to make some decision, they will not resist re resist it. And there is a chief secretary who actually is man in charge. And Gilgit Baltistan was not uh, given even that kind of autonomy. There was an agreement signed between uh, Azad Kashmir government and Pakistan uh, on um, um, 29th of uh, April 1949, where uh, Azad Kashmir was uh, uh, kind of. Uh, all the powers were taken away from Azad Kashmir government and Gilgit Baltistan was uh, taken um, directly was taken over by Pakistan and they didn't have right to vote or anything till 1970s and in Azad Kashmir also till 1970 there were no elections they were only appointed the Muslim conference was the only party and they ruled all other voices were seen as India are uh, traitors, are uh, seditious. So therefore, um, you know, this, this situation existed on both sides. On the Indian side, it was the pro-Pakistanis uh, pockets where uh, the resentment was shown and uh, National Conference was seen as uh, not uh, um, serving the interest of Islam and uh, the, the, the local people. And uh, on this side, uh, there are small pockets of pro-independence people who were very clearly secular and uh, they were not uh, uh, happy with, uh, you know, uh, Kashmir's accession with Pakistan or the Pakistani control in these areas. So, so these voices were actually from where the current movement was born on both sides. But they, you know, usually people um, who, who, who don't know the, the history of uh, Azad Kashmir, the political history of Azad Kashmir, the different political groups and different uh, political uh, ideologies, they, um, they think that uh, it was only in the Indian side that was the problem. And that is where the resistance was gradually grown. And that is where the resistance is. And there is no resistance to Pakistani control. Uh, but obviously, that is not true. Uh, it, you know, the, the, the resistance existed on both sides, initially very small, but then gradually grown into uh, something which it, on both sides was crushed with power and with the, uh, heavy hands. On this side, the pro-independence people were um, uh, deprived, you know, they, they, they were barred from uh, uh, taking any employment. They had to sign a oath or allegiance that we will support Kashmir's accession to Pakistan. If you want to go in employment or if you want to stand in the elections. And on the Indian side, if you are not a um, supporter of Kashmir's accession to India, then you are in you are in suspect you cannot uh, participate in elections or you you know you have to uh, um, declare allegiance with the, the indian constitution so those people who didn't do that they were not allowed to participate in election and some people who were pro pakistanis uh, and um, uh, you know for self determination they did participate in election but they signed that and uh, um, Sayyid um, um, 
uh, Gilani Saab is one of those people who were who who, who served in uh, Indian uh, uh, Kashmir's assembly for many years. And uh, uh, similarly, on this side, um, you know, people like Kaj Khorshid and all those who who were not for accession of uh, a state with Pakistan, but they did uh, fight elections. And Liberation League uh, is their party. And they stood for independence, but they did fight elections and, and they, they were elected as well uh, many times. So, so th this was the situation where uh, the new generation from 60s onward in the, in the Pakistani side, mm -hmm. from 60s onward, when the Mangala Dam was built, there was a resistance movement against that. And that was the movement when the pro-independence element in Mirpur was joined with the wider public. Before that, they were seen as marginals, as uh, um, you know, particular belong to particular brotherly or particular ideology. Therefore, they were not taken seriously. But when the Mangla Dam was uh, imposed on people of Mirpur, which um, um, kind of um, um, in which sub, you know which submerged uh, the whole of Mirpur city and about 300 surrounding villages. Then you know the you know the people who stood against that or spoke against that or resisted that, uh, they they were the people who were also pro independence. You know people like Abdul Khalik Ansari. So that was the time when Abdul Khalik Ansari became kind of leader, a bigger leader than just of one brotherly or one particular ideology. He was seen as a, uh, his, his reputation. You know became like he is a, a genuine leader. He's not for power, he's not for money, but he's for people's rights. That was kind of uh, perception which was uh, built of uh, the Alakan side. And uh, um, yeah, so um, it was then these two strains of politics which actually gradually grown because the ruling parties like National Conference and the Indian side, the Muslim Congress on the Pakistani side, they failed to deliver properly. National Congress did actually to some extent because they introduced reforms, land reforms, which were very, very advanced step at that time. Even in, in, in India, it was not uh, introduced yet. And uh, which obviously was benefited for, benefiting for a lot of pe uh, peasants. So they, they became owner of their lands. And uh, which was opposed by big land uh, owners who were mainly Hindus and, and Dogra, uh, Dogras from Jammu. So that was also one uh, kind of um, um, bone of contention between a National Conference and Jammu Dogras in the Indian side of Kashmir. But overall, the the, the you know the the exclusions of a National Conference were gradually became part of this. Uh, 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 pocket of uh, resistance, which was mainly Muslim conference and Jamaat Islami types, and then from there it grew and and kind of became uh, appealing for wider, younger people who were not happy at the way national conference was running affairs after state. So they they became kind of um, uh, resist voices of resistance, and on on this side it were the pro independence people. The resistance took the form of independent Kashmir idea here and very clearly secular and nationalistic uh, on the Pakistani side of Kashmir. On the Indian side, it took the form of uh, religious uh, identity as very important and also very soft corner for Pakistan. Not necessarily that they want to uh, be part of Pakistan, but they see Pakistan as their savior, as their ally, as their as some as a country who speaks for them. And, uh, but on this side, people, uh, you know, the people who wanted independent Kashmir and they see Pakistan as playing games. And uh, from 1947, in 1965, in 1970s, and in 1987, they, they, they saw the Pakistani uh, moves as capturing Kashmir and uh, rather than supporting the Kashmiris to decide their own future or be independent. And, but on the other side, uh, Kashmiris on the other side saw all these attempts 
uh, by Pakistan as Muslim country who wants their Muslim uh, uh, people to be free. So this, that is why there is a serious now um, contention between uh, the, the, the two forms of resistance in the state. The, the, the resistance on the Indian side and the resistance in the Pakistani side. And recently now, the Gilgit Baltistan obviously also woken up and there are loads of voices from within Gilgit Baltistan who historically demanded Pakistan that, you know, they should be made a province of Pakistan. They wanted to be annexed. They didn't want anything to do with the state of Kashmir. They were definitely not uh, part of, wanted to be part of Azad Kashmir or Kashmir overall. They wanted to be part of uh, Pakistan. But, uh, you know, for, for uh, um, the reasons uh, that there is, the issue is at United Nations and at one point there will be referendum and Gilgit Baltistani people, because they are pro-Pakistani, so they will vote for Pakistan. For those reasons, these regions were not integrated into Pakistan. But in the 70s, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto introduced some form of basic democracy there. And then it was gradually improved. And now they have assembly and, um, um, you know, their own chief minister and all that. But now there is a, a big uh, kind of argument there in, in, in Gilgit, Baltistan, that why our state subject was um, scrapped in 1970s. So what India has done now, Pakistan did in 1974 in Gilgit, Baltistan. And obviously when we uh, bring about these effects of history, people get angry because they don't know about that, because they're not told in the, in, in, in the official curriculum or syllabus. So that is why they think we we are making it up and we are uh, demonizing or we are uh, generating uh, uh, animosity towards Pakistan, which of course is not the case, which is not the purpose. It is the purpose is the people know the whole truth and then they make decision. And Pakistani people should understand that their rulers had made some mistakes, not only for themselves within Pakistan, but also regarding Kashmir. And obviously, we also want Indian people to know that their governments were not really nice with Kashmiris from day one. And they did play games. And yes, there were problems with the uh, Kashmiri uh, leadership, rulers of Kashmir on both sides. And they, they kind of played games as well with Pakistanis on this side and Indians on the other side to stay in power. But people suffered. And not only Kashmiri people suffered, but the Indians and Pakistani people suffered, and they still are suffering. But when they, you know, become this uh, hyper with the, their own nationalisms and any idea from Kashmiris, then look, we want to make our own decisions. They see this as treason, and they say, yes, they deserve it. These Kashmiris deserve it. They, they should be. Uh, you know, given more beatings, and they 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 they, they should be, you know, getting uh, you know get more punishment. So this kind of mindset is basically, uh, at the moment, uh, we are we are facing with, and uh, th that 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 is the story. So so the the question of Kashmir is primarily uh, is of occupation. The whole state is you know actually occupied. And uh, because it's, it's under military control. So there is about 600,000 troops in the Indian side, but there are at least two to 300,000 on Pakistani side. There's no exact numbers available, but roughly it is estimated uh, by different people that there are at least two, at least 200,000 Pakistani troops on the Pakistani side. And that is just Azad Kashmir. Don't know how many are in Gilgit, Baltistan. So, so they, they, they control the area. And the local governments are basically, you know, gradually they, they eroded their autonomy. And uh, I, I think if we be fair, the on the Indian side, the autonomy was gradually eroded. But on the Pakistani side, the local structures gradually became more empowered. And now the Azad Kashmir government is relatively more empowered than it was in 1940s. Uh, 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 
for 24th of October 1947 when it was formed. So it has evolved under different direction. And the Indian side of government evolved on different directions. But Gilgit Balsan also now have some kind of assembly. So therefore, um, the issue now is that either the whole state should uh, be demilitarized. That is the demand from uh, uh, all Jammu Kashmir People's National Alliance in Azad Kashmir. They have launched this movement that leave Jammu and Kashmir or quit Jammu and Kashmir. So they are saying the armies should leave both armies and uh, uh, then people should decide what they want. And uh, or these, uh, uh, you know, there are three uh, governments and uh, there should be one in Jammu. They should be given an assembly and the assembly should be given to Ladakh and Pir Panjar. And then those you know, then those people should negotiate if they want to stay in a state or if they want to go with India or Pakistan rather than one decision. But then there is also argument that it is the people of Valley who are fighting. So they, it should be their right to decide what they want. And but obviously the other regions, uh, although do uh, respect their sacrifices and everything, but they think no, no other region can decide for us. So either we all decide collectively or we decide regionally. So these are all the questions which are uh, kind of circulating in different circles of Kashmiris. And because we are not used to listen to the different viewpoint, so therefore our first reaction is when we hear something new or something which is not uh, according to what we know or what we want, we straight away call them uh, paid by the other power. You know, the people on the Indian side who does not uh, agree with the Indian position and they want a, a different um, uh, kind of um, uh, course of politics adopted, they are seen as Pakistani paid. And those who challenge Pakistani um, actions and uh, style of politics about Kashmir they, and their control over Azad Kashmir and uh, Gilgit Baltistan and their exploitation of resources and uh, um, you know the grip they having their hegemony people who challenge that they are seen as paid by India so this is the situation and obviously it is up to people and particularly here in Britain uh, to speak the whole truth and uh, not get manipulated by any one uh, 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 viewpoint or the other, either Indian viewpoint or Pakistani viewpoint, and speak for the all citizens, all citizens of the state, that they, you know, th that they should be given the right to decide their future. And uh, right now, of course, right now at this moment, the focus should be on the valley and the areas which where the curfew is on and where people are suffering and we should highlight that and we should do anything and everything we can i mean why this condition that you know we we should only uh, speak uh, uh, when it comes to politics of it because there is politics even if we don't say a word about anything about pakistan then that is politics because you are silencing the whole uh, other population so therefore um, you know, the best way to get united and to struggle together is uh, that we don't get trapped into communal politics. Because communal politics is what brought BJP to power. And communal politics is what kept Pakistan basically to where it is. Although here the, the communalist parties never won election uh, of the government, they never formed a government, they only, uh, you know, the Jamaat Islami and uh, other Islamic parties, they only get, you know, uh, certain seats in assembly, they never were able to form a government. But their impact was always there. And, uh, uh, you know, the people who ask for a, a progressive secular politics, or who um, think that government um, shouldn't have uh, anything to do with anybody's religion, 
is people's matter and they they should the government should respect all the religions and all the religious rights not just one particular religion i mean obviously what bjp is doing is 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 in closer to fascism because they got power as well uh, to 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 execute against other religions particularly against muslims in india and dalits and christians and you know sikhs and they done that before to sikhs so it is that religious communalist politics that is basically causing major cause of all the problems in south asia and when people say that you people who are not talking about muslim uh, issue who are, who are saying that kashmir is not a muslim issue you are dividing muslims then obviously they, their perception of politics is not much different although they don't have power and they are at the moment they are suffering and I, I stand with them but i don't agree with their politics and there are a lot of people who don't agree with their politics and they should not be trolled as uh, indian agents because that is what bjp is doing anybody who does not agree with bjp is trolled uh, is trolled as a, a pakistani agent and same here uh, with with pakistan you know the whole, we don't agree with pakistani position and then you know so many pakistanis say oh you are paid by india so so if so, so for us particularly kashmiris who are in britain and europe and america and everywhere we should speak the whole truth we should not uh, carry forward the positions of india and pakistan in britain or in america or everywhere if if we want that then we should clearly say that yes we want to go with pakistan we want to go with india then don't use the self self determination which according to united nation resolutions because because in united nation resolutions if you study it closely there is no self determination the right is only either to accede india or to pakistan so if you want that then very clearly say we want to go with pakistan and that is fine that is you know people have right to have that viewpoint and people have right to have the viewpoint that they want to go with india and i think then people should also have right to say we want to stay independent so the point where we all can to get, get together is right to self determination including the right to be independent or unconditional right of self determination or right of self determination according to un charter some people might be watching uh, now or later and they think while people are suffering on the ground and what you guys are talking about it is certainly that is the priority and obviously a lot of people are doing a lot of work for that but i think but as a as a kind of observer and uh, as a student of kashmiri politics of resistance i think it's also important that we um you know ask the hard questions as well before it's too late so that is why i'm raising these questions today that if you um, even if you uh, read the uh, reports two reports uh, published by un commission on kashmir in 2018 and one in july 2019 a couple of months ago they when you know they obviously they highlight all the human rights violations uh, in the indian side of kashmir in a very detailed manner and uh, um Uh, and also those in the pakistani side and in gilgit baltistan but the recommendations they made to them both governments about self determination is that respect kashmiri people self determination according to united nation charter and in the second report they say respect right of self determination according to international law and i think it's about time that uh, all uh, kashmiris uh, demand that and uh, and that will be test 
and I am sure that in Pakistan the position is changing and they do um, there are so many people who do accept that yes it is up to Kashmiri people and in India there is no shortage of people who are supportive of that and even in, even in this environment where anybody deviating from Hindutva ideology is seen as anti-national the people went to Kashmir from India and they got the reports information back in, and they told their own media that you are lying it nothing is normal there it is people are held at the gunpoint so they did speak up and they are labeled as um, you know anti-national similarly when some people speak from Pakistan that it is up to Kashmiris why, why are you doing an Azad Kashmir why are you doing an Gagazbalistan what rights you have given to people there they are then seen as you know anti-national as well so it is i think it is about all the people in india and pakistan and kashmir who are not for um, suppression and injustices of any type for them to speak up together against this communal type of politics and labeling a, the difference of opinion as treason or uh, as uh, paid by somebody else there might be some people of course agencies do work and we know they work right left center and they do use people and abuse people yes but that does not mean that any difference of opinion is uh, equated with uh, the somebody working for some agency you know you would look around and uh, you will find out that um, you know who what wh what is being said um you know does it make sense and if it does then no you know then then uh, no matter how harsh it looks um then it has to be said somebody has to say it but maybe i'm not the best person to say i know my kind of uh, storytelling and uh, <laughs> narration is not the best ones but i think somebody needs to say it and um, now uh, it's uh, time that uh, um, I better shut up and um, um, you know we, we, the, the streaming if it's not already uh, on Kashmir JK TV it will probably will be uh, you know the, the recording will be played or I might be playing it I don't know but I will check it when I um, go from here so thank you very much for listening, everybody. I know it's heavy and it's a lot of controversial things, but uh, I'm afraid uh, this uh, mindset that, uh, um, you know, one kind of oppression and uh, silencing is not acceptable and other kind of silencing is acceptable. I think this is not going to take us anywhere. So that is why I say things and thank you very much for listening and bye for now.